Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to, to talk here and to complement Gerard's course. So, yeah, essentially, Gerard's course was supposed to have three parts, spin glasses, static, spin glasses, dynamics, and random walks in random environments. And since we're one, th one way, well, one third through the lectures in two thirds of the time, I'll help to complement for the last part. So, the, the link between the spin glasses and the, the random walks in random environments is that for dynamics of spin glasses, it's a dynamics in a random environment and random walks in random environment is the same. So the only difference is spin glasses is on a hypercube or a sphere of infinite dimensions. Whereas here I'm gonna mainly talk about random walks on the lattice or random walks on random trees. And I'll mainly focus on random trees because this is what's uh, most, mm, well, mostly understood by now. So, random walks on random trees. So, most of the works I'll be talking about are something that uh, comes after um, all the work on spin glasses, and a lot of it has to do with Gerard's impulse, and I've been involved a lot with it. So the motivation comes from physical problems. Uh, one in particular that I like very much because it's very simple to understand is something called bias random walks and percolation clusters. So I'll come back to that later in my series of lectures, but essentially you, what you imagine is you take in ZD a labyrinth and you have like these dead ends everywhere and then you have a walk that wants to go through it and has a favored direction. And what you see when you start looking at the behavior of such walk is that it gets trapped into the landscape at certain points and then moves around very quickly, gets stuck into other places, and basically it gets trapped in energy walls. So if you remember a bit the keywords that uh, Gérard has been using, there's a lot about this minima of energy and the, the walk is gonna get stuck there. So in a very vague manner, the, the link between spin glasses and those random walks in random environments is a bit related to that. So basically we're gonna have wells of energy where the walk is gonna get stuck and we're gonna have trapping phenomenon and this is what, where basically what I'm talking about and what Jai is talking about comes to meet. So for now, I'll, I'll start talking about one specific model of a random walk on a random tree which uh, illustrates very well uh, the, this trapping phenomenon. It is very simple to understand. So the specific model is the model of bias random walk on uh, Galton Watson trees. So this will be actually the main focus, uh, my main focus for the, the two first lectures. So what I'm starting with is I generate a uh, Galton Watson tree. So I give myself a family P0, PK of random numbers. And what I will do is I will generate a random tree. And basically I start from a root, pick a number of kids in a random manner according to this law. So here I want some of the pk's to equal one. And what I'm gonna assume also is that the average number of kids is bigger than one, meaning that the tree is super critical. And we know that in this case, uh, we can always impose that the tree is infinite. So if ever we are in the case where we always have at least one kid, so the probability of zero kids is zero, then you just have to go ahead and do it in an independent manner. You start, the first guy has three kids, you repeat the procedure for the offspring, and you just continue going like this. You get an infinite random tree. Now, in the case where you might have zero kids, you might have leaves, then thanks to this condition over here, we know that still with positive probability we can have an infinite tree, and so I will condition on the fact that this tree is infinite. So condition on tree being infinite. So 
So sometimes you'll have a guy like this one which will die, or this one, or this one. But you know that somewhere, some of the offspring line is going to survive. So when you have this, basically you have an infinite random graph, and you can start asking questions about what does the dynamics look, look on those infinite random graphs. So this is the Galton Watson tree, and now the dynamic I'll be interested in is the one of the bias random walk. So here it's actually very simple to see how um, this is defined. I only need to introduce one parameter, beta, which will be the bias. And so right now it's a positive number, and I'll put some extra restrictions uh, in just a second. So a bit informally, so here are different configurations that you might find in your Galton Watson tree. So think that the root is uh, towards the origin. And you put a coefficient one for the edge going upwards and beta for the edges going downwards. And if there's no edge, just imagine that there's a zero. You do this, and then uh, to get your uh, transition probabilities, you just divide all numbers by the same number so that it sums up to one and you get transition probabilities. Oof. So you do this everywhere. Here, the normalization will be different. In here, while you have your transition probabilities, you're forced to go up. So you just basically do this on the entire tree. You're giving your entire random tree, and given your number beta, you get transition probabilities everywhere. So you notice that if beta equals 1, you get the simple random walk. Everyone has the same change, chance of being taken by the random walk. If beta is lower than 1, uh, you prefer an edge going up to an edge going down. And if beta is bigger than 1, you prefer edges going down. So the, um, since the, the tree is exponentially growing, uh, it's still, it is possible to have a favored direction upwards, but still be transient, meaning that you leave uh, zero at one point. So this question of transience and recurrence was uh, settled by Russ Lyons in 91. And what he actually proved is that well, if you start by picking a random tree and then run a random walk on it, then if you look at xn, it's going to go to plus infinity. So here, by this notation, I mean the level of xn, of xn, or the distance from the root to xn. And this is almost surely for every tree. And every walk, and this is true if the bias is larger than one over the average number of kids. So basically, if your bias is sufficiently high, bigger than the inverse uh, exponential growth factor of the tree, then you're going to infinity. Basically, the faster it grows, the less bias you actually need to go to plus infinity. So from now on, this is the regime that I'll be most interested in. Uh, I'll assume that the, the walk goes to plus infinity. And um, the next question that was asked is, well, you know that you're going to infinity. Now, how fast are you going to plus infinity? And this is where the interesting things start to happen. So the thing which is known is that if you look at xn divided by n, this goes to some limiting number, almost surely. 
And this limiting number, we call it the speed for natural reasons. And there's a very interesting phenomenon that happens um, if ever we get, um, we're in the regime where we can have zero kids. So the, um, the interesting part in this regime is that if you look at this limiting speed in function of the bias, then we have this thing that if the bias is very small, lower than some critical value, so if the bias is small enough, the speed is zero, whereas the speed is zero if the bias is larger than some critical bias. So which means the following thing, if you push the walk just a little, it goes fairly fast to infinity, whereas if you start pushing it a lot, it actually goes extremely slow and gets stuck. So you might wonder why, why this happens, and uh, on the picture it's actually pretty clear what happens. So just start doing your tree, ding, ding, ding. This dies, this guy dies, this guy dies, and here you have some part that manages to survive. So, <clears throat> when you look at this part over here, you know that once the walk enters this subtree here, of, well, imagine that the bias is extremely large, a million, then when you're here, you, you have a million more chances to go down than to go up, so you'll go down, and here the same, you'll go down. You're forced to go back up, then you're pushed down, forced to go back up. You have to get a million times here before you can get to this point. You have to get a trillion times here before you can get to this point. So this very small structure will cause you to lose, lose like trillions of units of times. So it means that in time a trillion you've probably just managed to get over here. So because of this factor you really see that really large biases uh, can be really bad for you and make you slow down. So even though in a lot of places in the tree, like this one, having a bias one million would push you to go further, because of this trapping structure, those wells, you actually get a slowdown effect. So, let me go back over here. So if I did a um, drawing showing the speed in function of the bias, we have this point where we start being transient. First, our speed is going to be positive, and after a certain limiting bias, our speed is zero. And we know that in the middle we're positive. And so, here, a lot of things happen. So first of all, there's a lot of remarks should be done. So remarks, uh, or like questions more precisely. Question one is uh, when V of beta equals zero, how fast do we move? So, okay, we know that our speed is uh, zero, so it means that we're going sublinear, but are we going at n to the one half? Are we going to some power of log or some log, some power? So that's one question. And the other second question is, uh, what is the shape of the speed when V is positive. So I did a drawing like this, but as far as we're, we know, the speed could actually look like this. This is not something that we can exclude up till now. 
And um, so those are two questions that I want to, in the, well, the rest of the lecture, I'll focus mainly on those two parts. Um, so I will first start by talking about uh, what happens in the zero speed regime. So the reason for that is this is the part where you see a lot of links to what happens uh, with spin glasses. The thing which is uh, really nice and uh, interesting is that actually there is an underlying, like an idealized model, an underlying idea which helps us to understand both spin glasses and uh, this model of bias random walking random, random environment. And actually it allows us also to understand uh, random walks, one dimensional random walks in random environments. It allows us to understand, probably allows us to understand bias random walk on percolation clusters and all the myriad of models. Actually, as far as I'm concerned, I think that all um, random walks in random environments which have a favored direction, so like this one, you're going to plus infinity, well, to plus infinity in the direction, or bias to random walk on a percolation cluster where you have a favored direction. All those models should be understood thanks to one simplified idealized model, which is known as the Bouchot trap model. And for the rest of my time, this hour, what I want to do is to introduce quickly the, well, the Boucher trap model, make some comments on it, and ex try to explain why this might be a useful model for us. So, I mean, so the, the Boucher trap model predates me quite a bit. Uh, so I, I actually don't, I think originally it was introduced for spin glasses, right? Yeah, or, so originally it was introduced for spin glasses, but actually it turns out to be really useful in those models as well. So, Boucher trap model. And it's of often abbreviated BTM. So, <clears throat> it's a model that's basically supposed to capture a lot of the specificities of trapping. So, to start, I'll, I'll introduce a very, so this is basically an idealized model for trapping. And basically represents, uh, is representative, representative of lots of models. And basically, we talk about something called the universality class, meaning that there is a behavior which can be seen in this model, which is universal in the sense that it applies to a whole range of models. And so basically, if you understand this model well, and you can approximate uh, some other models saying that they're close to this one, then you can actually prove a lot of interesting results. So I'll focus on uh, a particular subpart of this to start with, which is uh, a bit easier to understand, which is something which I, I call the completely directed Boucher trap model. This model is uh, going to be completely trivial, but still it's, it shows you some interesting things. So imagine that you have a one dimensional line. So zero, one, two, continue like this. And what you do is at each site, you're gonna assign, uh, assign a random weight. That's for example, to zero, to one, to two, to three, where the two eyes are ID, random variables. So basically those numbers are gonna represent the depth of a trap that you put there. So you have a one dimensional line and you throw traps of different depths. Do you use different notations or? Okay. It's just that it's two and not two, three. 
Oh yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Um, where the two eyes are ID random variables. And so the dynamics I'm going to put on this is extremely simple. You start at zero, and you're going to wait. The dynamics is the following. Start at zero. Wait an exponential time. Exponential meaning the random variable. So you take a random variable that's exponential with mean to zero. And once this is over, you move to one. And then when you're at one, you just repeat this procedure. You wait an exponential amount of time with mean to one, and then you jump to two. And so basically, when at n, wait an exponential amount of time uh, with mean to n. Then go to n plus 1. It's basically the simplest dynamic that you can imagine. You take the minimal amount of random environment that you can. It's a one-dimensional line. You put random variables everywhere. Simplest dynamic that you can imagine. The underlying walk is actually just jumping to the right all the time. The only thing that's random here is your waiting time. And basically, what I want to claim is that this model actually essentially encompasses the behavior of all random walks in random environment which have a favored direction. And um, so how do we, well, if you want to understand this uh, model, what do we do? One natural question, for example, is to ask how much time <coughs> do we need to get to n? So I'll denote this number by delta n. So it's a random number. So in this model, it's pretty stupid. Uh, it's just sum from 0 to n minus 1 of, let's say, exponential to i. So what we have here is nothing more than a sum of ID random variables. So all the exponentials are ID, and their mean are ID with a certain law. So now I'll make an assumption and the assumption will be that the two eyes have a tail which is called heavy tailed. So meaning that uh, that they have an infinite mean, so. Like, so. Hmm? Oh yeah, there's the T shifted. So basically, why am I interested in this case? This case is the one where actually trapping is felt in the sense that, well, the expected time that you need to exit a trap has infinite expectation. So here I use the notation L of t. What is L of t? L of t is something, is a slowly varying function. Which means that for all numbers, we have that L m t divided by L t goes to one when t goes to infinity. So this types, uh, the slowly varying functions typically think a logarithm, for example, or a power of a logarithm or something like that. Something that has a very smooth uh, way of behaving at plus infinity. But for example, something that would be sinusoidal would not be in this category.
So, <coughs> so when this happens, uh, well, what happened, well, what's, when we have this assumptions, this assumption, we know that actually the right scaling for, so to simplify the notations in the cycle, I'll, I'll just take L of t equals one because otherwise it makes things very heavy to write down. That. So let's just assume that our uh, tail decays as t to the minus alpha. Then we know from general theorems that this thing here converges to a stable law of parameter alpha. So this is standard sums of ID uh, random variables heavy tails. And so I'm going to go a bit further now and try to explain, okay, what happens now if I don't, I, do, I want to look at something that's more than the actual um, time it takes me to get to time n, but I actually want to look at the process of how long it takes me to, re the whole process of how long it takes me to get to time n. So it's a bit unclear. Right? But let me do a drawing, it will, it will be clear. So let's say now that uh, so what can we say about the following thing? So you take this family and you want to look at what does this process look like? What can we say about this process? So over there, I just looked at the endpoint. The endpoint is a stable random variable. So what can I say about this? And um, so let's look at this line here. And this is one, two, blah, 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 n. And here I'm going to plot the two eyes. So every time the two eyes are choosing in an ID manner, and we get different heights or waiting times, which looks like this. So we get a cloud of point like this. And what I want to do is to describe what the limit uh, object of this thing is. So I, I have those points. The width here is n. Because our assumption on the tail, we know that the order, this is, I don't know if it goes in the camera, the highest, the order of the highest points is going to be n to the kappa. So if we take this picture and we rescale it in n in this direction and n to one kappa in this direction, what we'll get is something of finite size here. So 0, 1, and kappa is alpha. And here we get something of finite size. And what you'll see here is a Poisson point process and of density dx alpha uh, t, so this is this is x, this is t, uh, alpha t to the minus alpha minus 1 dt. So basically what does this mean? It means that along this coordinate we put uh, the points are uniformly distributed, which means that uh, you should, okay, sorry. You should think Think of uh, this image here as traps of different depths that are thrown around. And basically what the limiting picture tells you is that you throw traps uniformly in space and that their depth has a density which is given by this tail. And so essentially what you'll find is that you have high peaks and a lot of points concentrated very close to the origin peak, small points, one high peak, small points, high peak. So 
So which essentially means that you have a lot of small traps and certain traps of very important depth. So. And um, now what the stable subordinator is, So is given in the following manner. So <clears throat> what you ha so how do we construct our process in the discrete case? We throw around traps and then we sum the time spent in the different traps. So the time spent in the first, plus the time spent in the second, plus the time spent in the third one, and you keep doing that, and that's our process. So our limiting process should just be, we take this Poisson point process, and we sum the time spent in the different peaks. So basically, the stable subordinator here is just, what we do is we sum the time spent under each cross in the Poisson point process of intensity uh, dx alpha t to the minus alpha minus one dt. And so if you did a picture, what you would get is something like this. So here's, uh, time, and here's your stable subordinator. And what you'll get is essentially the thing will not move until it sees one big trap, and it will jump up, and then not move for a while. It's going to see the next big trap, poof, jump. See another huge trap, jump. And in between, it's essentially constant. So what you should see from this picture is that um, so what you see from this picture is that, well, the way you should think about it is that the walk is moving around. For a long while, it sees traps that are fairly small and essentially uh, moves around, but without spending any time in it. Then it sees one big trap and spends an enormous amount of time in it. And then for a while, he's going to explore a lot of small traps, but they don't amount for much of the time spent. Well, they don't amount for much time spent in it. And then you see another big trap, spend a lot of time in it, and then get stuck. So. Um, so let, let me just say uh, let, let me just say uh, a few things, and uh, I'll actually let uh, Gerard continue after that. So um, so okay. In this energy, so basically, you have this line, and you start throwing away traps of different depths. You start, uh, you start to throw uh, traps of different depths. And basically, uh, what I want to say is that there are three types of traps. There are going to be deep traps, important traps. Very deep traps and small traps. So meaning, um, this refers to the depth of the trap. So this is very large 
to i, small to i, and this is a uh, large to i. So <clears throat> the idea is that in the t between um, the level zero and the level n, typically the largest trap you'll see will, has, will have size n to the power one minus alpha. So basically, if 2i is in 2i is in the interval c n to the 1 minus alpha, let's say epsilon and big M, I call it deep. If 2i is larger than m to the m times n uh, power 1 to the alpha, I call it very deep. And if 2i is smaller than epsilon n to the 1 minus alpha, I call it small. So um, the intuition here is that is the following. Uh, very deep traps are not seen. So what I mean by this is that in the amount of space you explore, in, you explore, you're never going to have the opportunity to see a trap of uh, of a depth which is bigger than m to the n power one minus alpha. Is m is very is very very large. You typically don't see those traps. See, small traps the time spent in them is very small in the sense that they will only account for like epsilon n to the one divided uh, 1 over k amount of time. So basically, there are a lot of them, but they're not very deep, so the time spent in them doesn't uh, sum up to something significant. And the key parts will be the, big, the deep traps. The deep traps are the ones that govern the behavior of uh, this entire system uh, in the sense that they amount for they explain the whole behavior of the walk. So there are essentially a finite number of them, and they're very deep, and they, they swallow up all the time that you need to get to time n. So you'll have essentially a finite number of uh, big traps, so let's say 100 of them, and they will make up for 99% of the time that you need to reach to, to go to level n. And um, so this actually means that um, this actually means that uh, as you move around in the space, your walk moves and then gets stuck in one place for very long, then jumps forward, gets stuck there for very long. And there are only a few finite places where you're actually likely to be after a big time. And um, this uh, is, there's a property associated to this, uh, which is called aging property, which is very characteristic of the trapping models. So basically what aging is, is uh, a description of how likely a walk is to be in the same trap at two different units of time. So basically, if I ask the question, let's look at x at time a n, uh, and uh, let's look at x at time b n, uh, what's the probability that, are, that they're in the same place? So what's the probability that the two uh, in this random landscape 
you have the walk moving around, and you're asking the question, what's the probability that I'm here at time a, uh, a n, and at time b n? And it turns out that this thing can be computed explicitly and uh, has a limiting law, which is the arc sign law. So I'm just verifying. So it's the arc sine law of parameter alpha applied at a divided by b. So this is for a uh, smaller than b. And what you get is that the arc sine law of parameter alpha at x is going to be sinus alpha x divided by x integral from 0 to 1 over x so basically what you can see here is that uh, the probability that uh, a walk at two times uh, two very different times at times a n and at times b n, which are far away. So huge amount for a very long amount of time, uh, a linear amount of time, the walk is actually stuck in the same trap, and with positive probability. And this probability is given by the the arc sine law, which I wrote here. <coughs> so the the reason why. Hmm? So um, where does this formula come from? Uh, this formula might seem a bit weird. Why do, do you have an arc sine law appearing here? And the reason you get an arc sine law appearing here is um, this is something that hap well, it's a thing that's related to uh, stable subordinators. So basically, it's the, well, it's the probability that the stable subordinator will jump over the time uh, a, uh, the, the interval a, b. So, I don't know. Um, I'm being a bit, um, anyway. Um, so, uh, okay. So this underlying model of the, um, so we have, we, we have this uh, Bouchot trap model directed. And um, basically, the, so the idea, what you have to um, keep from it is that you have a one-dimensional uh, random walk with exp well, waiting times which have, have heavy tails. And in such uh, setting, what happens is that in the limiting object, you'll see a stable subordinator. And uh, what this allows you to do is it allows you to um, prove different types of properties such as aging, and you understand the long time behavior of the walk. And what's, uh, so the, the reason why this is important is because if you have any type of model which uh, on long time scales behave in a pretty one dimensional manner and where you have trapping, that model should be governed by similar types of uh, the limiting, uh, the limiting behavior of that model should uh, be a stable subordinator and should show aging. So there are a lot of different models uh, that enter into this cate category. One-dimensional random walks uh, exhibit this type of behavior. The biased random walk on the Galton-Watson tree uh, exhibit a similar type of behavior. I will try to, to explain that uh, in a bit more details next time. And uh, actually, it turns out that this model is also relevant to analyze um, spin glasses. And um, so, so next time I, I'll try to focus on explaining in um, a Galton bias, Galton, in a biased random walk on a Galton Watson tree with leaves, uh, where the tr does the trapping come from? Why is this model, which looks like a tree, actually behaving like a one dimensional model? And uh, what types of uh, results can uh, we deduce from that? And uh, then I will also uh, like to comment a little bit on um, 
the, the question that uh, I raised, that we know that the speed looks like a bump and then is zero, and I would try to, to comment a little bit on why uh, do we believe that there's a bump, meaning that first the, the speed goes up and then it goes down. Why is it not possible to see a uh, wavy type of behavior? Try to explain uh, some uh, results uh, related to that. So, so for today, uh, I will uh, stop here. <laughs>